Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Tamir Massas. I'm from Israel, and I'm very excited and happy to be here with all of you to see uh, familiar faces and new faces here in the temple. Uh, the last two and a half years, I'm try to regularly come here and uh, to practice. And I want to take this uh, opportunity and to thank Chongan Sunim for hosting us here and uh, invite us and uh, teach us this very, very special and unique. Um, I always said that there is like four kinds of temple, different temple. And we are all seeker. So we look for different temples or we look for something. This is why we come here. In the East, there is like four kinds of different temples. The first kind mean you come to this temple and there is no food, no teaching. If you arrive in this kind of temple, you must run away. It's like a cemetery. You will die over there. The second kind of temple, you come to that temple and there isn't much food, but there is a good teaching. So try the best you can. Try to stay as much as you can, because it's very rare to get a clear teaching in our world. The third kind that you're looking for, different temples or different teaching, you arrive in a temple that there is food, we say, but no teaching. This is like kind of hotel, good hotel. Maybe you stay one night. The day after, say thank you very much. Then continue look for a different place. Don't stay over there. The fourth kind, it's very important because there is food. Also, there is very clear teaching. If they throw you away from this temple, beg to come back. So we are all lucky because we come to Wong Kong Sa and there is a wonderful food. Thank you, Mikey, for support our stomach very, very well. And we have a wonderful teaching. Thank you, Chungan Sunim, Zen Master, and Doke Sunim for this wonderful teaching. And it's very rare. I travel for six years to the Middle East and, uh, sorry, to Southeast Asia and Far East. And it's very rare to find a place that can give you all this kind of condition and very good teaching. So I hope that we are all make that we pay in our way. We make our effort to study and to understand and digest this teaching. Then we can share this with other people, other sentient beings. So I welcome your question. Please ask question. There is no good question or correct question. There is a question. So feel like to ask any question you like, please. How shall I do? Uh, how shall I deal with all the pain I have during sitting? Because uh, I'm practicing the question, "What is this?" and a lot of the time during the practice, I'm not dealing with the question. I'm dealing with the pain in my body. So, what shall I do? Okay. Yeah. You're not unique in that. Human body equal pain. You cannot escape that. Nobody can escape that. Even older monks, older nuns, we are all feel pain, physical pain. Also have some emotional pain and many different kinds of pain, okay? So we all experience that during the sitting, walking, bowing, sometimes chanting. We feel pain, maybe in our knees, our back, our head, and many other parts in our body. The most important when you practice, okay? So be clear about the pain. Perceive your pain. Don't try to check your pain. Don't tell yourself, for example, I shouldn't have this pain. I'm sitting already two, three years. I, be, I need to be more flexible. 
Once you start to check your pain, the pain will grow and grow and grow. Then all your 50 minutes sitting will be thinking about this pain. So if you perceive clearly your pain, then you can see, can I handle it and just return to the practice and observe it? Okay, be with it. Oh, I have to change a position. Once you decide to change a posi position, don't check yourself. One of the teachers that I really like always suggests that when even you change your position, do it mindfully. Don't lose the mind at practice. So sometimes the body gets pain. Just perceive it. Don't attach to it, don't check it, don't compare. We come here twice a year, our Israeli group, this wonderful group, yeah. So sometimes you compare. Oh, last time I didn't have so much pain. Why this time I have a lot of pain? I thought I'm making any, any kind of progress. Why I'm dealing this, with this again? Doesn't matter. Just perceive. Can I handle it? Or I need to change a position. Once you decide, don't check yourself. Just do it. And we are practice together. So try to do it quietly as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Do you think there is an end of suffering? End to the suffering? I have to say that I don't know. I'm still suffering. But we teach something very important. We teach to come back to this point. So if you come back to this point, you can only perceive your suffering then not much indulge with it, not much fight with it. Then the second thing that's more important is to perceive the cause of your suffer. How do you make yourself suffer? I think this is very important. Not all the time I can see that I make my own suffer. But once I can see it, I wake up. Because usually when I don't see that I make my own suffer, I make myself angry, I make my own fear, etc., etc. So I accuse and I blame other people with that. So our practice is very important. You sit and there is 50 minutes and sometimes lots of anger come up. You know what I'm talking about, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you cannot move. You cannot go outside the room. You have to digest it. Not processing in your mind, I mean, not think about it. Just to be with it, just to perceive it, just experience that. Then you can see it's come from a certain cause. It's there for some time, then it disappears. It teaches you something very important. The law of impermanence, we say. It's come, stay, and then disappear. <laughs> then you think about it again, then it's again arise. Stay for some time, then again disappear. Most of us need to, need to think about that, oh sorry, need to explain that again and again and again and again until we can just put down. Don't touch it. Actually, give up. Don't indulge with it. Don't check that. At that moment, for maybe a short time, you explain the end of suffering until the next thoughts that appear. So we all fall down sometimes. I think the best question is to ask, how fast do you get to stand up? How fast do you return to yourself? How fast do you return to your breath, to your body, to your clear mind? I don't know another way to stop this suffering. About shorting the suffer, I don't know what does it mean, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Also wondering about raising a family, and specifically kids, in the way of Zen. I mean, from your experience, how is it to raise kids with teaching of Zen, the Dharma? Don't get to ask many monks that. Do you have kids? No, I do not. So why are we talking about kids now? I don't know. You want to raise kids? At some point. Okay. 
I have three boys and I still don't know how to raise them. I have no specific, you know, rules. You should do that and later you do that. And they always teach me. They are the greatest Zen masters. From the first point I wake up in the morning till I <laughs> go to sleep night time. It's never clear. It's never clear cut, you know, you should do that and that. But if you really attend this clear mind, then I don't know how to explain that because there is probably no explanation. But in a natural process, the action appears. In a natural process, some words appear. And you do lots of mistakes. Me and my wife, we already put money aside, you know, for therapies in the all day. <laughs> we are probably make mistakes, you know. I'm sure about that. So I think the best suggest to you, don't afraid to do it. If you want to do it, do it 100% from all your heart. Then they expand that. And hopefully they will take them, take this with them. Yeah, try. <laughs> First of all, I would like to take this opportunity and really thank you for suggesting me come to this wonderful place and have this retreat. <sighs> I really, I really thank you for, for that. I am part of the Israeli uh, Sangha for five years now. And I heard a lot of stories from you about the time you were a monk. And now I have the opportunity to um, experience it by myself. And finally, I understand you. I understand why you stayed for so long in South Korea and why you became a monk. But it's, in, it's very interesting for me to, to ask about two important points in your life. The moment you decided to become a monk and the moment you decided to become a layman again. You want to become a monk? A layman, excuse me? You want to become I thought about a monk? <laughs> you should talk with Zen Master Chong Ansonim about that. Okay, I will tell you about my two decisions, okay? The first decision was to become a monk. I came first time to South Korea uh, uh, at, in May 98. Uh, Chong Ansonim was the head monk. It was rule, all the room, kept clear mind. I was only 22 years old. And in a few days, I fall in love. I remember that I walk even one, one year later, I still walk around with the feeling I found heaven. There is a heaven in this world. I can't explain this feeling, but from the first thing I was waking up in the morning, I was with a big smile in my face until I went to sleep. It was like that. But still, when I sit and start to ask myself the question, should I stay here? Should I become a monk? Is it correct? Is it not correct? My mind was, no, you're almost 23 years old. You need to get married. It's too late for you. <laughs> this is, was my thinking at that time. My parents, uh, they get married very early. They were early, 20 years old, okay? So this kind of thinking, you know. So I wasn't sure. And also I had lots of money in my pocket. And if you have money, you have planes. So I continue to travel in the East. I went to Vietnam, Nepal, India, many different countries. But still, always think about this practice. Always talk about this Kiolche, these three months and the wonderful experience. Also, I was very arrogant. I thought I got something. This wonderful question, what we've been asking in the interview. So I went for different teacher, not just Zen or Buddhism. I went to India, I lived for six months over there, and I went to different ashram, like uh, centers that people are doing spiritual practice. 
and asked them, is this a cup or it's not a cup? <laughs> I was very arrogant. <laughs> but after one year, I had a meeting with a few people I knew, and one of them bring a girlfriend. And we just sat in north of India, in Dharamsala, drinking chai, evening time, wonderful place in the mountain. And I explained Zen and with lots of happiness and I'm very into it. And she asked if she can ask a question. Very politely, very quiet, you know. So yeah, you can ask whatever you like, you know. Do whatever you want. <laughs> and she said, why, when you talk about that there is lots of happiness and excitement, why you didn't stay over there and do it 100%? This question was like a hammer in my mind, like that. At that night, I didn't sleep. All night, I was thinking about it. Why didn't I stay? I saw I have a, a, like a habit that I come to a good place. I don't stay. I continue to look for another place. You know, it's kind of a, a habit that you are that I always run from one place to another place to another place to another. Maybe the other place will be better. I, was, I, was, I always want to be over there, not to stay. I went south to New Delhi. I bought a flight ticket. I returned home. I worked for two months and then took a flight again to South Korea. And begged for taking me, please, to become a monk. So this is what the first for the, the, my decision. And it's wonderful because in Korea, compared to different country, or in our Korean tradition, compared to different tradition, we don't accept it right away. We let you work for that. I did one year hangja training. Hangja mean hang, action, ja love. I was like with brown clothes, and only cleaning, washing, do this stuff for one year. Then after one year, if you still want to stay as a monk, then you take the precepts and you become a monk. To be a monk was the best place and the best situation for this wonderful practice to do that. Look, the temple gives you everything. It's really amazing. You know, Zen Master Sun Sun say always that uh, monks and nuns, they are already a millionaire. They have four million dollars. The first million, it's food. You will get food all your life. It's worth a million dollars? Yeah, it is. The second million, it's you get medical all your life. Doesn't matter whatever your body will need, some people, some wonderful Bosanim donor, donors, they will give you, they will serve you. The third one, they will give you clothes. Not what you like, but this kind of clothes all your life. And the last thing that's very important, every temple in this world, every center in this world, it's your home, it's your house, it's your home. You can go everywhere. So I understand this is the best condition to just jump into the practice, completely give up everything just to be in the practice. And for me, I love the practice. Even if I have a free time, I try to practice. And sometimes I still feel kind of, kind of sorry appear in my mind that at that time I didn't did 100%. Like nowadays that I'm coming here for only eight days, this is what I can take now, I try every moment. So you are lucky. You are in, on the cross that you can choose to become a monk, to give everything. So this is what's for your first question. The second thing, after four years, I understand exactly with what I walk. I really believe that each one of us, there is like a deep attachment that most of us 
we don't know in the beginning what is the deep karma, what is the root. And after you peel many layers, then you reach this point. For me, it was loneliness. I came from a home that my parents, when I was eight years old, they decided to divorce. I'm a first son, as you know, I told you about that before. And I saw the house change completely from a very happy house to very sad, very cold. So start loneliness, start to appear this feeling. And I deal with it a lot. So even I was living as a monk, I didn't find this loneliness because you live in very warm feeling environment. Everyone wants to support you. Nobody check you. This was really strange for me. I came from a house that both of my parents check me a lot. They want the best for me, but they check me. They always compare to the other sons and to compare to the sons of the neighbors. You know, it's like that. We like to do that. So I came to a temple that nobody checked me. Maybe I was too young to, to be checked. I don't know. They are all, most of them was, you know, around the 30s plus and almost 40. So I decided to went, I decided to go to Myanmar, to Burma, and to have a small kuti. It's like a really small room. It's deep in the forest and you stay alone, completely alone. And the first day you feel very strong. You have a target. You come to conquer the loneliness. You will change it. But the moment the sun set, my loneliness appeared. And when I was young, when I was lonely, I looked for a different girlfriend. I thought that if I will have a girlfriend, I don't feel lonely. This was my mistake. I felt that I will find something external. Then it will relax something inside me. It took me many different relationships to understand that it doesn't matter what I will find outside, it will not change the feeling inside. Maybe for the first month was really good, but after it, the same feelings start to appear again. So after 100 days, I stayed for the 100 day, I really could digest this loneliness because I could see people only once a day when I bake the food, then return to the kuti. Then after four years, I decide that it's time to come back home. I always want to bring this wonderful teaching to Israel as the best place that I think that we really, really need it. We are smart people, we are clever, there's lots of strength in, the people, in Israeli people, but not always clear. Sometimes we use it against each other. So I really, really want to do that. This is why I decide the second decision and continue to make a connection with the teacher and with the practice. And it's wonderful in our tradition because we came from a school that there is two kind of lineage, a monk lineage and lay people lineage. And we could continue practice and to be close to the teaching. Thank you. If you try to push them away, your thoughts, your feeling, your emotion, they will stay even stronger. The best suggestion that I got from our wonderful teacher is don't touch it. But we don't know what does it mean to not touch it. They let us to give to do something, we are very good about it. But don't touch it, just perceive it. Just let it come, let it stay, and let it go. That's all. This is already our practice. But once you start to talk with these thoughts, it becomes a conversation. Then you hear the, the chukpi, you start to think, then suddenly again the chukpi. Where I was, oh, 50 minutes gone. I was completely thinking. 
So try not to touch it. And we give many different ways uh, to do that. Use the mantra, use the question, just perceive sound and space. We give you many encore how to do that. It's like you're doing your mantra, you sit and you do consembosa, 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 consembosa. And you see your mind is like talking and do things. Go to the supermarket, buy some milk, you know, send mail to a different friend, all kinds of stuff. But you can choose. Just return to the mantra. Don't deal with these thoughts. Then you can see her true nature. The thoughts just come and go. It always change. And it's completely empty of what you say about it. Don't make it good thoughts or bad thoughts. So maybe in the beginning you have a bad thoughts that come up. I really believe, but this is only my belief, Ayelet, that uh, we all day we keep ourselves busy not to get to this kind of thinking. Once you stop, all the thoughts come up. So maybe in the beginning, many bad thoughts start to appear, regrets, frustration, anger, all kinds of stuff, stuff like that. Then if you continue practice, this thing will come again, but slowly, slowly it will come down. <clears throat> then another kind of thoughts start to appear, even more difficult, these lovely thoughts. You, took, you think about, oh, this is heaven. I should stay here even more. Maybe I talk with Chong Anthony. I want to stay here. And you completely not practice. You just think. Then maybe after a long time, you start to realize that also this kind of thoughts doesn't really help you. Then you return to this clear, beautiful floor. Not so much interesting, but you return to this floor. You can really see the color. Oh, the floor is brown, wow. I couldn't see it for 50 minutes. <laughs> then inside your heart become calm, your mind become calm, calm, your belly, everything start to relax. And really can do what Dokesanim said. You can really enjoy the moment. It's wonderful, yeah. Thank you. I want to thank you all for your question and to come here and do this wonderful practice. That's, uh, for me, it's very important. I can't really express how deep and how important this wonderful practice. I guess only when you get far from here and you deal with lots of problems in your life, then you remember, wow, this wonderful pressure moment that I could sit and just, just breathe. Nobody asked me to do anything special. I don't need to give any special answer. I could just relax. So it's really, really wonderful. And I want to encourage all of you to do this wonderful practice, not just for yourself, Take what you are gain here, what you are experiencing here, what you develop here, and take it to your family. Take it to your friends. Take it to your neighbors. Make a big waves. How can we can make each other really happy? And nothing really special, but we can be in harmony. And this is one wonderful thing. Thank you all. <laughs>